talking and they are all very excited. We had an excellent <laughs> session yesterday. No, we had an excellent session yesterday and everyone is just, um, is very excited for this as well. I have this so. question about, I have a, um, a photograph of me. I have a plus on this side and a minus on the other side. To see everybody, do I push the plus? Uh, you're on an iPad, maybe. <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> okay. Billy, is there a speaker view symbol coming up, maybe in the top right of what you're seeing? Yeah, uh, that would be the I speaker see, view. There's this thing. At, uh, yeah. Let's do this again. Share content participants. Well, I, I guess it's fine. I, I can be seen, right? Yep, yeah. we can see so, and hear okay, you. And I can see people when they come up, so it's fine. Will we yeah. hear the questions or will you read the questions? I guess around, you know, four o'clock your time, you're all, all in the East now, right. you know, I'm in okay. the flyover country, but anyway, um, around four, four, 10, I guess we'll turn to questions and I can just pop on the Q and A function Oh, okay. And sort of distribute those. Okay. Um, I'll read those. I mean, I can read those and maybe shape those a little bit and make sure that they, you know, that our conversation flows beyond that. So, okay. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Yes. Lovely. That sounds great. It's not like there's enough anything happened in the news, you know, that will keep it <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Is there anyone left in the American power structure does not have COVID-19? That's the question of the day. You know, so. I want an update on who doesn't have it. So, yeah. so everyone, we are live. Attendees can Hi. see us. Well, hello to everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I think I'm just going to give it one more minute and then I'll do our introduction and we can get started. Okay, great. Cool. I think I make... I'm going to make some more light. OK. Now, what if we, okay, okay. We're good. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Crisfanti, and I serve as the Director of Community Engagement at the Dramatist Guild. Welcome this afternoon. We're so happy to have you join us. The Dramatist Guild Legal Defense Fund, the DLDF, is a nonprofit organization committed to free expression in the dramatic arts. For more information, please visit dldf.org. Today is partnering with the Political Engagement Initiative of the Dramatist Guild of America, a 101 year old trade association, which advances the rights of over 8,500 playwrights, composers, librettists, and lyricists across the United States. To present this afternoon's online panel discussion, to highlight Black writers who are censored and excluded from our collective cultural fabric. I would like to recognize Amy Von Masick as the co-producer of today's event, Unknown Legacies, Black Playwrights in America. DG and the DLDF are proud to welcome William Maxwell, Professor of English and African, and African American Studies at Washington University in St. Louis, Mary Helen Washington, Distinguished University Professor in the English Department at the University of Maryland, and William Harris, Professor Emeritus at the Eng English Department of the University of Kansas, to discuss playwrights of Miri Baraka, Alice Childress, Claude McKay, Lorraine Hansberry, Richard Wright, and many more, and why these eminent writers are not part of the theatrical canon as we know it today. And with that, we will start with Professor Maxwell. All right, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Amy, for putting this event together. And it's good to see old friends. <laughs> I said that in the best sense <laughs> for all three of us. Okay. <laughs> Billy Joe and, and Mary Helen. We do really know each other right? yeah. and have read each other. And I, I very much appreciate the work that, that they've done. That's plowed really important ground for everybody who works in the field. Um, 
I think we'll, we'll talk uh, amongst ourselves, as we say, for maybe about an hour, as long as that's interesting. And then we will open it up to a Q&A session with anyone in the audience who's interested in uh, making a point or pressing a query forward. We're happy to do that. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about the event beforehand, and we thought that we would concentrate early on, at least, on two figures, Alice Childress, who Mary Helen has worked on and has helped to recover um, in various ways, and Amiri Baraka, whom Billy Joe has been working on for many, many years, and <laughs> is, in fact, the definitive critic and scholar of, I would say. <laughs> um, so Mary Helen, I thought I would start with you. If you could just maybe tell us a little bit about Alice Childress, who um, his returning to historical work and conversation, but is relatively, relatively unknown. He's, she's born in 1916, dies in 1994. And tell us a little bit about what are the forces that may have kept her from being recognized until pretty recently. So we'll start with Alice Childress and Mary Helen, if that's okay. Okay, we're, we're not sure when Alice Childress was born, but it's almost uh -huh. certainly- Ah, okay, I stand not corrected. 1960, <laughs> because she altered her uh, age a lot. Oh. She said it was very important in the theatrical oh. world. I'm not sure I wanna leave her out of the canon because she's kind of slowly but surely working herself her, her way back into a, a canon, certainly in African-American literature. Mm -hmm. uh, Childress uh, was uh, writing plays from, as far as I can tell, 1949 until she died. Mm -hmm. And I would concentrate today on the plays that she wrote between 1949 and 1956, because that's the Cold War period. And in, in some ways, the plays that she wrote during that period, I think, have the most relevance for our topic today, because even though I would say that all of her plays are about two things. They're always about race and they're always about the Cold War, at least hmm. these plays in, in this period. So first play is Florence, which 1949 comes out in masses and mainstream. And of course, you know, masses and mainstream is definitely a Marxist publication. So she sort of makes her entree into the theatrical world through um, leftist circles. Second play is um, Gold Through the Trees, 1951. Clearly a very militant, racially militant play. But as I read all of her works, the, the subtext of every play is the Cold War. And I'll go back and talk about these plays more as we go along. Third play is Wedding Band, 1960. No, no, it, it's the... Um, uh, the play in 1955 is Trouble in Mind. Again, she's taking on anti-communism. Um, that's a play that actually wins an award in 1955. And then th the last play that I would talk about would be Wedding Band. And even though it came out or was uh, produced professionally in 1972, she finished it in 1963. And again, it's one of those plays that takes on issues both of race, Cold War, anti-communism, and then in that play, uh, an interracial love affair. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I could go on because Childress wrote novels, she wrote short stories, she, you know, mm -hmm. she's prolific until her death in 1994. But I think, you know, her standout period is this 1940s and 1950s and 60s. Right. When I was in junior high school, we read A Hero Ain't Nothing But a Sandwich right. with uh, is one of the most frequently banned <laughs> books in public libraries to this day, in part because it deals with heroin addiction. Um, but just, just to follow up a little bit before we move on to Barack and his basic situation, um, mm -hmm. Mary Hall, could you tell us a little bit about where and when these plays were produced, under whose auspices? I know that Alice Childress worked with the American Negro Theater. Um, was an important actress as well early on. And one of the reasons that she turned to writing plays is that there were not a lot of great parts for talented African-American actresses in the era. Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, her first play is Florence. And as right. I say, it was published in a Marxist magazine, but it grew out of her work with the American Negro Theater. Okay. And at the American the Negro Theater, she's working with Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte, right. Lorraine Hansberry, and all these other actors. And they formed the American Negro Theater 
because of the way black actors and uh, playwrights were being treated by the mainstream theater. Mm -hmm. So, but it's interesting that she wrote uh, um, that first play, Florence, in opposition to or in response to what some of the men in the ANT American Negro Theater said that right. plays about women were not plays about race. That right. if you want to do a play about race, you had to have a male character. And she wrote it to show that women were just as intricately involved in those issues as, as men were. Yeah. Another story I've heard about this play, it, it's almost too good, it must be apocryphal, is that uh, there was a sort of dare or bet among the members of the American Negro Theater. Could a play, could a really good play, a producible play, be written overnight? Yes. Oh. Is that true? Or <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> Your story I don't know. Is but if Childress was dared to do that, she she certainly would have done it. But but it is interesting that even though you know this is her first play and it's a play that was responding to the black men in the Negro, the American Negro Theater, all through her life, she was always writing plays in which she had to take on men in the theatrical world as well as whites. Right. Uh, every single play, all the way to Wedding Band, she had to fight to make the main character a black woman because Joseph Papp, the famous Joseph Papp said, we could take it to Broadway, Alice, if you would only make it a play about the white man and not the black woman. And of mm -hmm. course she refused to do it. She got all the way to the Shakespeare, the Shakespeare theater, but not to Broadway. Okay, that's, that's fascinating, thank you. Um, so we'll turn back to Alice Childress in, in a minute, but I thought we might turn now to, to Billy Joe and his work on Amiri Baraka, a figure who I believe is still better known, had an uh, amazingly varied, um, important, influential, and controversial career in almost any genre you can imagine. But I think, you know, came to literary fame as, as a playwright with Dutchman and, and, other, and other plays. Um, Billy Joe, could you tell us a little bit about Amiri Baraka's work as, as a playwright and how that's been either canonized or not in American academic circles? Yeah, I, something I wanted to start with is, he may not be as well known as some people. Yeah. Uh, uh, but he is known by, uh, by a lot of people. It's just yeah. like it may not be absolutely, uh, it's not gonna be Broadway. But right. there are all, but there are people who, uh, uh, who know him. Uh, there are uh, books appearing on him right now, scholarly books. Um, um, so he's just, he, uh, there is something called the Amiri Baraka Society, which mm -hmm. sort of amazed me. I didn't think Baraka would, you know, ever have a society that he was too, that he was too wild and unconventional. And it turns out to be a really terrific uh, uh, organization. But uh, so he's not totally outside the limelight, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's always sort of a, uh, it's kind of a problem to get him to get him center stage. And you think about, you know, in this moment of, um, uh, of all concerned about about uh, about race, uh, he's not quoted very much, which really surprises me. And Baldwin is quoted a lot more. And I just think it's I don't think it's really true, but they find him safer to quote. They're more comfortable with Baldwin. And they're less comfortable. They're less comfortable uh, with uh, with Baraka, but he started out. Uh, and Dutchman is the play he's made him, and he won, and he won an O before, and that was night nineteen sixty And um, you know he was on his way to being this incredibly. Uh, famous writer and he, he is a famous writer but not famous in the way he, he could have been and what happened was um he made a trip to cuba mm -hmm. in 1960 and he writes about this an essay called uh called uh, uh i've forgotten what it's called it's, it's in uh, cuba, cuba libra right yeah. and uh what happens there 
before he is before he goes to Cuba, let's just to do it quickly, he's a beatnik. Uh, and he is totally connected in that world. And I write about it, I'm very interested in it. And I think that he's profoundly connected and there are these loving relationships in this world. I mean, it's a very important thing to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and he thinks of himself as a rebel. Mm -hmm. Then he goes to Cuba and he finds out he's not a real rebel. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he becomes uh, politically uh, uh, involved. Mm -hmm. He doesn't become a communist at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's interesting in the FBI files, it looks like uh, they, they think he is. Uh, yeah. But uh, he's radicalized and he comes back to the United States and he's, dis and he's disappointed with the beats. Mm -hmm. And what starts happens there. As long as he is rebelling as a beat, uh, he's, he's becoming famous and celebrated. Uh, 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 what happens is uh, uh, Malcolm X is, is killed and he becomes a cultural nationalist, moves to Harlem. So he moves out of the Lower East Side, he moves to Harlem. Uh, and so he's, he makes two moves, which keeps him from being, let's say, wildly popular. One is becoming a black nationalist. Mm -hmm. As as a black nationalist, um, he gets involved uh, in anti-Semitic um, uh, gestures mm -hmm. and and poems. Mm -hmm. And as the way Baraka does everything, it's very much out loud. It's put in the most sort of provocative terms. Mm -hmm. uh, this last and. Uh, uh, the nationalism and the uh, anti-Semitism lasts to around seventy-four, mm -hmm. and he gives it and he gives it up at 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 that point. And there's the thing about it, and he's a guy I'm really fascinated in. I mean, part of his be becoming an anti-Semite in this way is I think it has something to do with a certain amount of guilt he felt about being uh, in the white world too long. And it was, you know, so it all part, it's all fit, fit into his national, uh, into his, um, uh, into his nationalist period. Now, mm -hmm. something interesting in terms of vision, if not, vision, if not, uh, uh, if not censorship, is when Dutchman is formed in 64 downtown in, in the village, it is a great play. It is it gets it gets an, an OB as uh, as I said earlier. The same play is produced in Harlem, and when it's produced in Harlem, is considered an anti-white play. I'm it's the exact same play, uh, and um, the Black Arts Repertory Theater, which he's in charge of in Harlem, loses its money. The government money is pulled out of it. So that's sort of interesting. And another thing is just, uh, you know, in terms of how, how this works, a friend of mine who was, um, runs in much more high flute in circles than I do, was talking to somebody on the MacArthur uh, Foundation. And this is approximately what this guy said. He said, I don't care if that anti-Semite writes as well as Shakespeare, you'll never get a, a MacArthur Fellowship. And so over, I think, you know, that's one of the most powerful forces of uh, this period where, uh, where he had taken on anti-Semitic uh, uh, character. And there was a later controversy about a poem around the 9-11 events that- Right, and what's interesting about that- Yeah, please. Like, yeah. You know, I'll be right two... back. Please, please oh, tell that story and I'll be right back. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, am I still here? No, I think, on my screen, uh, it it says uh, Alice, Alice Childress. We still can hear you. We still hear you. Oh, you. You can see me. We still hear you. Okay. We still hear you. Fine. Okay, great. Um, what happens uh, with there are two poems, and he's he's more famous as a poet, and also which I think is kind of wonderful, more controversial as a poet because poetry is not 
you, you don't think of something gets in the newspapers, cause trouble. Uh, Baraka's uh, poetry does. There's a poem in the 60s called Blackguard, uh, which is actually a fascinating poem. And then it's a poem which uses stereotypes of, of uh, all sorts of, and I think intentionally all sorts of, uh, uh, of people who are black and including, including Jews and, it, and they are stereotypes. Now I think something's interesting and this is an anti-Semitic poem, but I think something that's interesting about the poem at one point there's a line that says, um, I, it says there can't be love poems written until love can exist in this world. So it sort of gives the sort of context about, about why this poem, uh, why this poem uh, exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it puts in anti-Semitism in a very kind of, I think, interesting sort of, uh, interesting sort of light. Okay. Uh, when I was uh, doing an anthology of Black American literature, um, uh, uh, various people at the publishing house said, we will not publish this poem. Uh, because they, you know, because they said it was an anti-Semitic poem. Mm -hmm. So we moved, we changed publishing houses. Mm -hmm. And usually I don't think that would have happened. I think it would happen if you just stay with the publishing house and you cut the poem. So this is how censorship works. Uh, uh, the 9-11 uh, poems, uh, Somebody Blew Up America, uh, was performed at, uh, at, at a poetry uh, festival in, um, uh, in New Jersey, um, you know, of course, after, after 9-11. And the poem uh, caused all sorts of controversy. He read the same poem at Penn State when I was teaching at Penn State before, so several months before, and there was, people were very upset about the poem. But what I think is interesting about that poem is there are two different threads going in it. There's one, which seems um, it is definitely uh, anti-Israel. Anti I don't think it's anti-Semitic. I know some people make this distinction, I do. There's another section of the poem uh, which is talking about, about Jews and various people being victimized. Uh, but what has happened, I was talking to this gentleman, this just happens over and over, and he said, you know, I really can't read Baraka. And he quoted certain lines from the poem. And he knew really nothing about Baraka. So what has happened is, and this is a form of unfairness, tonight, is people have gotten together, quoted some sections from this, this very complicated sort of poem. And that's all. And they don't talk about the other parts of it, the, 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 the rebellious parts of it. Uh, the, the combination of the uh, of, of the Nazis, et, et, uh, et cetera. Well, thank you. And just b before we move back to Alice Childress, a kind of last question in this preliminary round, if we want to call it that. Um, I like Brown. Yeah, like Brown. that's good. That's good. Um, it, Baraka is not an actor per se, not a member of Equity. Oh, like, but he is one of the most talented, amazingly powerful readers of poetry yes. that you can imagine. There are all sorts of recordings are available. Anyone can go to YouTube to see him. He also did important work with free jazz musicians. He's a major right. and explainer of free jazz to other audiences. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about Baraka's kind of performative or dramatic nature, even as a poet? I mean, I, I saw him, he, he was a teacher of when I was in college. Um, at that point, he was a kind of button down Marxist. This is the early 1980s. He wore a tweed right. suit and a red, black, and green tie, but led us through pretty rigorous exercises. But the one thing that was unusual in that class is how often we read dramatically. And he was- and wait, wait, you said he taught this class? You took a class? Yeah, he a class that I took at Columbia University. He was there for a while. Okay, right, right, right. No, mm -hmm. I'm interested in that because so many people yeah. have taken that. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, he's a major, he's a major teacher of lots of people in, particularly in the New York area. He also taught at other- Also in, in DC and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but can you talk a little bit about him as a kind of theatrical exponent well, or presenter of poetry? Yeah, I wouldn't 
call it theatrical, mm -hmm. even not meaning it's incredibly involving. Uh, but uh, Sir, and Alden Nielsen has a book coming out on this about yeah. jazz, reading, uh, Baraka reading with, with jazz. A and something that, uh, you know, one of the points of the book is Baraka really always wanted to be a musician. Right. You know, in this sort of free jazz environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, by performing as he does, you know, when he starts, he will, I don't want to do this because I'll knock off the, uh, <laughs> but, you know, when he starts to read a poem, he goes, you know, he, he creates a, he creates a rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he, you know, he even sings at some point. And sometimes it's, it's quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, he is thinking of poetry as performance. And when I interviewed him once, you know, I said, you know, what form do you want your poem to be in? And one thing he said, you know, he didn't care if the written page disappeared, which I don't think is true. <laughs> but, you know, he wanted that sound. That's what, you know, in one of his famous essays is called How You Sound. Right. And he's terrific at, you know, bringing, creating that sound. Mm -hmm. And a sound that this, this, you know, this all goes back to the blues. And if, you know, if you do right. that sort of tradition, he comes out, it's free jazz, but it's free jazz associated with, with blues. Right. Uh, if you go with that tradition, uh, you know, it's a singing tradition. It's tradition, it goes back to, you know, it's an oral tradition. I mean, it goes back to, it goes back, uh, back to, not after, but early African-American experience. And when I came to New York uh, and was on a, lot, on a subway with a lot of black kids, I realized, gee, that sounds like Baraka. I mean, it's the same sort of voice. Yeah. But, but so there's this trying to, you know, capture that sound mm -hmm. and the sounds of the music. And it is quite extraordinary. And people are taken by it over and over. Right. His poems are full of attempts to register pure sound, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. Invented words. Yeah. And, you know, all the, the, the scatting. Yeah. And that, all the uh, making up of uh, making up sounds. Yeah. yeah. OK, w w one of the um, someone on chat in the audience mentioned that Baraka had taught at Stony Brook. I believe he had an appointment there for a long time. If, yeah, thank you. I taught. I taught with him at Stony Brook. <laughs> really? Okay, that makes a lot of sense. All right, but Mary Helen, I think that you have a, a a more sort of visual presentation that you may want to to give us as part of this introductory. Yeah, I do want to like look at this. From here. Yeah, please. Okay, I do want to look at some of these visuals because, you know, Childress because she's the work that I'm talking about is in the 1950s and 1940s, well, mainly the 1950s. Let me see if I can get this to come up. It doesn't seem to want to play. We can see your first slide, I think. I know, but I want to go to the other slide. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Well, then you've, you've exceeded my grasp already because Okay, I can... there we go. Okay, uh -huh. so there you go. I, I, I found right. the arrow. Okay, oh, there she is. So, uh, to show some of these visuals because again to try to get back to Childress who is you know 10 years really before Baraka yeah. and back into this moment of the Cold War that I think is very hard for people to understand who are you know past you know are, are younger than a certain age you know certainly younger than me it's harder to understand what kinds of barriers were facing black artists and I'm thinking now of black playwrights in this early period when there was so much resistance to any kind of uh, uh, black struggle and uh, militancy. So I'm just gonna show you some visuals just to introduce you to Childress and to how radical she was for the 1940s and 50s. She was associated with every left-wing organization including the Communist Party. I, I don't know whether she was a communist or not, but she certainly was a part of the most radical left groups. So here he, you have her in this picture. This is a picture with Herbert Becker 
and you are Guineer. Uh, people may know Guineer from his daughter, Lonnie Guineer, but Guineer was a trade union activist and communist. And Herbert Thecker was one of the major communists in the United States uh, Communist Party. And so, you know, there's right. children there in the picture. I also wanted to look at a few of the slides from her uh, FBI file because she earned her left wing uh, <laughs> reputation. She earned it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, every page has a list of all the organizations that she was involved in. I just have to look at some of these from the Civil Rights Congress to the Freedom, the Frederick Douglass School, Masses and Mainstream, the Jefferson School of Social Science, where they taught Marxist philosophy and Marxist history. All of these eventually are going to be on the Attorney General subversive list. And Childress seems to have been I'm sure she wasn't unmindful of her FBI file, but she seems to be absolutely, you know, uh, intrepid, just, you know, <laughs> being in all these, she walks in the May Day Parade. Um, she worked with the things that we wouldn't even think of as radical, the teachers union. She tried to get black, uh, she was always trying to get black actors in the unions where whites were, um, segregating themselves. She's a member of the National Council of the Arts and Sciences and Professions. And again, to our 21st century eyes, that doesn't, that just looks like a little organization. It was on the Attorney General subversive list, right? And then there's the Committee for the Negro and the Arts. I think that was one of the major organizations that she was involved in. And it's interesting in, in one of the good things about the FBI file is it gives you so much biographical information. It tells you where they were, uh, who they were with. So they, they're fantastic biographical uh, <laughs> materials. Uh, and always it's the confidential informant of known reliability who tells you something. Here she is in Negro History Week and she was in that every year one of the things that she did, though, as a dramatist, is that she worked with the Civil Rights Congress to put on a play at the Club Baron, and then it was reviewed in uh, Paul Robeson's Freedom magazine, and sometimes by people like Lorraine Hansberry. So she created this network of left-wing res uh, artistic resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have to think of her as, as very much a part of this kind of coterie of, of leftists. Mm -hmm. uh, always being, you know, her comments always, uh, many comments about her being in the, uh, the Daily Worker. She, she also was working with left-wing whites in, for example, the Czechoslovak workers' home, and sometimes um, Jewish workers. I mean, you know, she, she covered the gamut. So this is, you know, Masses and Mainstream, which publishes her first play, um, Florence. And uh, let me just make a comment about how, how, how radical Florence is, although not to, you know, 2020 audiences. So one of the things about the Cold War is that it tried to suppress dissent. This is one of the hallmarks of the Cold War. Bill, you can chime in here at any point because you know all of this. <laughs> all right, so what kinds of dissent are, 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 is the State Department and the government trying to control and suppress? It certainly is black dissent. Okay, so here, I, and I'm just gonna look at this play and look at some of the, the, the uh, lines in the play because she stages Florence as, um, in a way so that the actors come in through double doors and when they reach the stage, the stage is divided into colored and white. Okay, this is 1949. This means she is staging segregation so that it's represented visually. The white characters come in and they have to turn and walk to the white side. The black characters come in and they have to turn and walk to the black side. And then what happens, the characters have an interaction. So there's, there's three characters in this play. One is Mama or Mrs. Whitney, and the other is a white woman, an upper class white woman, Mrs. Carter. 
they begin to talk to each other, friendly at first, of course. And then little by little, Mrs. Carter begins to say the kinds of things that a liberal white person would say, thinking that she was being you know, kind to Negroes. And mama, who is on her way to New York to convince her daughter, Florence, to come back home because Florence has gotten ideas that, quote, a Negro woman shouldn't have. She wants to be an actress in New York. And so mama has been sent, because Florence is now out of money, mama's being sent to New York to bring her home. At the end of this conversation, as she interacts with Mrs. Carter, she begins to get angrier and angrier. And at the end of the play, she decides to send the money to Florence and with a note that says, you can be anything you want to be. And so she's, again, look at how she's staging this, this whole resistance to, uh, to segregation. Mm -hmm. And that resistance was, it, it, let, let me give you an example of how race was working in 1949. What could you not say? I mean, you couldn't say the word white supremacy. The only people who were saying the word white supremacy were who, Bill? Communists. Communists. <laughs> only the communists. They were the only ones. They started saying did that. Get, Mary Helen, did I get that right? <laughs> got that right. OK, good. <laughs> yes. So you know, even the terms that you were not allowed to say, you were allowed to say racial prejudice. That was it. Yeah. The, the, the concept of structural racism that came right out of the Communist Party and the people on the left. And so this play, in a sense, is staging that kind of look at the way structural racism works, but also look at the way an ordinary working class woman like Mama is resisting that. So it's mm -hmm. a very powerful little one act play. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'll stop there. I'll pick up with the other plays as we go along. Okay. Just one thing we can notice right away from, you know, the, first of all, thank you for the images. They're, they're wonderful. Yeah. They really help to tell the story. Okay. This magazine, Masses in Mainstream, that looks like the Scottsboro Boys? Is it? No, this is the Martinsville Seven. Ah, okay. Okay. And so, you know, that- Tell us about them. I was going to say something about Masses in Mainstream. Just, say, just publishing in that magazine would have led the FBI directly to your home because- Directly. It was the literary magazine of the American Communist Party. Um, that's 1950. It's the height, right, of first wave uh, post World War II anti communism in the United States. So just allowing her play to be published there was courting a certain level of danger. As you said, she's quite intrepid. But sorry about the error with this photograph. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the, the Martinsville. Seven. Okay. So, but 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 it's 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 parallel to the Scottsboro case because it's another case that um, communists were involved in. I think the NAACP was actually involved in it too. But again, this this is part of the second act of her play, "Go Through the Trees." So, "Go Through the Trees" is published in or produced in 1951. You couldn't get any deeper into the Cold War than 1951. Is that right, Bill? I mean, I would say that that was a nadir, a low point. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it comes in different. A low ways, point. But it's a low point. But a high point of, of the Cold War. Yes. So, absolutely. Go Through the Trees has four acts in it, and it's it's a dramatic review. You know, it, it's a dramatic musical, and civil rights play, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. But part two is called Martinsville, mm -hmm. and she simply has the mother of one of these men. Okay, so these men were arrested in 49, in January of 1949, for raping a white woman in Martinsville, Virginia. Martinsville, Virginia was considered a kind of uh, uh, um, more, more liberal place, which of course in 1951, you know, yeah. could have meant, you know, downright racist. Is it near Atlanta or? It's, I don't know where, it's in Virginia. It's in the Southern part of Virginia. Okay. So they're arrested, seven of them. A, a couple of them were too young to be uh, tried. I think they were like 12. Um, they arrested, tried for the rape of this white woman. Apparently some of them were involved in, in the sexual assault, not all seven of them. 
in one year by January of 1950, well, two years in 51, they were all executed. They were executed, all seven of them in two days. I think it was February 2nd and February 5th and all executed. So it was, it was a real travesty, but who wrote about it? Who had the nerve to write about something like the Bartonsville Seven? Well, in the second act of the play, she has the mother of one of these boys Mm -hmm. talk about what these children were like growing up and then dramatically at the end of the uh, uh, of this section she has a character come in and call out their names and as they call out their names a bell peals for each one of the seven mm -hmm. uh, you know she's taking on racial stories that you know playwrights did not deal with and she's taking them on in a way that 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 critiques and condemns um, the treatment of blacks in the United States. In fact, when I went through this play, I was thinking of how much everything that Childress did has a real bearing on what's happening now. She called out every one of these stories of an unarmed man being killed by the police. She wove them into her plays. Mm -hmm. um, so this was one, you know that try to keep alive the idea of the uh, of what happened to these young men. Right. It sounds in part that one of the things that she's doing is kind of building on, extending, giving new life to 30 social realist traditions, which were obviously produced in a different moment before yes. the classic of American anti-communism. I mean, Laxton Hughes writes a famous play about the Scottsboro Boys. Yeah. I'm not saying, called, don't you want to be free yeah exactly it seems right. like she's sort of keeping that tradition alive extending and changing it but so it, can you see this off. can you see this copy of the page in freedom yeah okay so this yeah. page in freedom was you know cor it, it, it was like uh corresponding to what she was doing in the play so mm -hmm. you know childress is working on freedom another um publication that's going to be banned by the attorney general mm -hmm. and here's the Mary Hill put out freedom who who is responsible for freedom that we, well this is mainly paul, you know i mean it was Robeson. paul robeson's idea lorraine hansberry worked on it lloyd brown worked on it and alice childress beulah richardson you know yeah. all, so many people on the left worked on it Right. But again, look at what you see in 1951. If I had seen something like this when I was in elementary school and knew that there were people out there who were, who were fighting for black freedom in 1951 in this kind of resistant, you know, powerful way, mm -hmm. um, you know, showing the Martinsville Seven being hung by, hanged by uh, the Statue of Liberty. You know, that's the kind of thing that that leftists did visually and and uh, Childress did in her in her plays. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that the word at the bottom of this, the, it, the critique is this is an example of white supremacy. Right. 1951. That's amazing and prescient in all sorts of ways. It's also interesting, too, since we're talking to dramatists that um, these circles of resistance seem to be constructed, at least in part, with dramatists at their center, right? I mean, you have Paul Robeson, right, who's obviously does a lot of different things in his life. He's a major political figure, but, you know, an actor, right, <laughs> and writer uh, of plays uh, as much as anything. So, so I have a, like a fancier question, but there's a there's one real practical question up that I think a lot of people are probably thinking through right now as you give this presentation about Childress and Baraka. So Mary Helen, what would be the best place to look, practical place to look, to get a collection of Alice Childress's plays? And I'm going to ask the same question to Billy. If you were going to buy a single volume or a couple in order to just yeah, yeah. confront this work, um, where would you start? Well, you know, Kathy Perkins put out a, uh, a book on Childress. I think this might be the only I think this might be the only book that I've seen that has a collection of her plays. And uh, she doesn't have all of them, but um, she's got all of her 1950s plays here. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, as is, you ask this question, what is it I'm surprised. Pardon? What's it titled? I'm sorry. It's called, uh, Selected Plays, uh, Alice Childress. 
Okay. But I, I was surprised when I got this book that there is no real scholarly collection of children's plays. I mean, right. one that would introduce them and put them in their historical context and their um, you know, scholarly academic context. There's just, there's nothing like that. There's been, you know, relatively little attention paid to, to children's. I just found a clip of children's reading at a, 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 a play reading. She's reading um, along with, um, uh, trying to think of uh, Max Roach's, what, Abby Lincoln. Abby so Lincoln. Abby Lincoln is reading the part of Julia in Wedding Band. And, and there's a little clip of them on YouTube. And it's the first time I've ever seen Childress, um, you know, live. And certainly right. the first time I've ever seen her actually read her plays. And she's a fabulous actor. Yes. Yeah. yeah. She's an award-winning actress early in her career. Absolutely. Yeah. She, you know, she actually, now she, all the things that I've read say that she won an Obie in 1955 for Trouble in Mind. But Perkins says that she was not able to find any real documentation of that. But I, I do think that that is true. Yeah. She was very well known in off-Broadway circles, too. Mm -hmm. So, Billy Joe, what would you suggest to folks trying to find their way into Baraka's work? Yeah. Well, those? one thing, okay, oh. two things, and this isn't self-advertising. The first thing is my collection. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, he's, he's the, bragging. This is the standard collection. <laughs> okay. And the reason, I mean, so this, uh, I don't know what it's about, 81 something. Mm -hmm. No, that's can't be. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's been out for about 20 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I did it, and so what it is, it's, it's, it's so it's called the Leroy Jones and Mary Baraka Reader, mm -hmm. um, edited by William J. Harris. And who published uh, that, Billy Joe? Well, at, it says on which one, is, here's the funny thing, it switched publishers. Mm. And I just pulled a copy from the, uh, it originally was published by Thunder's Mouth Press, but it isn't anymore, it's published by another press. Okay. And uh, I'd have to go upstairs and pull another copy to see uh, what the other press is. But this really deals with his entire career. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is a good place. It is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, talking about somebody who's, you know, uh, doing lots of different things. So it has things from his poetry. It has from his music uh, criticism, blues people. It has all... Uh, it's arranged in each of his styles, meaning like from being a beatnik, uh, being uh, being a uh, being a black nationalist, being being a communist. It's all here. So mm -hmm. this is a, a good place, a good place to start. Now, an interesting about thing about this book, when I was teaching at Stony Brook and I was teaching Baraka, um, there wasn't a book. I mean, what I would do, everything, not everything, but most things were out of print. I don't think blues people's ever got out of print. No. Uh, but so, you know, I was us using um, Xeroxes mm -hmm. and, you know, um, and, you know, and, the cl and breaking copyright law. And so I, I called him, Mary, and I said, I want to do a reader. And I got him. He's not a very easy person. It was 10 o'clock at night and I got him. <laughs> and he said, uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, you can do it. And Thunder Mouth Press is interested in it. And that's where that book came from. Gotcha. And it's, it, is, it is a good introduction to his work and even has Bar uh, Baraka's criticisms of it in his, uh, in his short introduction. <laughs> uh, this book is called SOS. And this is his poems, mm -hmm. and it's you know it's relatively cheap. Cheap is uh, is um, published. Um, it's published by a major publisher, uh, Grove Press, and this covers his entire career. And this is the best book 
uh, uh, so you get the, the career was published, uh, you know, just like uh, a year before he, before he died. It has some extraordinary new poems, uh, uh, some beautiful lyric uh, poems, and it covers the career. And the paperback edition has oral poems of Baracus. So it has that sort of, uh, you know, that tradition uh, also. So it's, you know, the published poems and then poems which are uh, representative uh, representative oral poems. So those two collections. Thank you. Some yeah. very helpful folks in the audience are placing up in the chat function if you want to check it out, um, more detailed publication information. So thank you for that. So. I have a question about maybe putting these figures together a little bit, at least potentially. Um, in Baraka's sort of famous mid 60s moment, when he becomes probably the most famous and influential black writer in the world, right? Around the time of the black probably. repertory school and so on. Um, he also is very- oh, since you're putting it there and not, okay. Yeah, no, I'm just sure. thinking, I'm just thinking in that moment, you know, it seems he he thinks that he's the lodestar of black art as he moves to Harlem after the assassination of, of Malcolm X. Right. Yeah. And there's good arguments that he is in certain ways, um, though he's forming this theatrical collective in Harlem in a brownstone that they, you know, that they renovate themselves. But what I was going to ask is this. In that moment, his attitude towards prior generations, uh, black American artists, playwrights, writers, is I think it's safe to say dismissive or, or well, like if you look at uh, the yeah. essays in um, in Home, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, he, yeah, he dismissed uh, uh, Black Lit. It's interesting, and he dismissed uh, both Baldwin and yeah. and Langston Hughes, right? And he reverses himself, yeah, as he learns, you know, as he as he learns the tradition. I think he I think he spoke at Baldwin's funeral. Yes, he and did. He did. There, there's uh, one photograph. His talk oh, is in sorry. my book. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Is it? Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's quite beautiful. When it comes to his reclamation of uh, Langston Hughes, there's amazing pictures of him at the Schomburg Library. Oh, dancing. Dancing, dancing with Maya Angelou. Over yeah, the beautiful. Space yeah. Where Langston uses ashes have been buried right. on the marble floor um, to sort of make that burial an, an active and productive one. But th the question I was going to ask is this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm winding, winding no, up. No, no, I was, I was happy. <laughs> no. Go on, yeah. So do we know about the relationship to the extent that there is one between Baraka and Childress or maybe Baraka and the generation of the Cold War that Mary Helen has written about so well? Um, can we think about that? I mean, how did these two, and maybe the forces they're associated with ex exchange uh, ideas? I don't, I, I don't know, uh, and I do not really know her work, but what I was doing was, you know, so I'd know something, you know, reading around and, and, and what Mary Helen was saying earlier. And they're so similar mm -hmm. and they both are, let's say, maybe my mother's term, pig-headed, or strong-minded, uh, you know, both involved with both involved with with left uh, politics, uh, uh, but I don't think I don't I don't think there's any you know connection, and I don't remember him ever talking about her, mm -hmm. uh, and he does come from a very different moment. I mean, there's that that fifties. It's that we'll call it beat, it's much more complicated. You call it avant-garde moment. Mm. And then there's that cultural nationalist moment. Uh, and then there is um, the commie moment and he called himself a communist, right. uh, not a Marxist. Uh, and that starts with 19, 1970, 1974. So you see, I see parallels, you know, and, uh, before they were talking about magazines, uh, I don't didn't mention Freedom Voice, that's later. Uh, what are the Marxist magazines we talked about before? Uh, masses, the new masses. The masses, the masses, masses and so on. They're, yeah, and they're, Baraka, they're, was, yeah. Baraka was publishing in all the magazines of the, that, of his particular moment, and Negro Digest, which right. is 
extraordinary. He becomes Black World. It's right. This extraordinary magazine. Yeah. Well, that, you know, it's interesting that they that their lives were so parallel. Yeah. yeah. Working, you know, in in the 1950s and the 1960s. So I, I'm thinking of Wedding Band, which is um, first produced in '66, and then its biggest production is in '72. And you know, when I look at yeah. that, I think about the way in which Childress represented a form of dissent and racial resistance. It's never as overtly available as Baraka's kind of um, resistance. I mean, he's- I he's like, so I love the way you're describing it. Out there. <laughs> readily you know, available, I mean, outrageous. Readily available, you can't, you can't <laughs> miss it. Okay, so I, I want to think about Wedding Band and the kind of racial resistance and, and racial power that's in this play about a black woman who is in a relationship with a white man. Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing that happens, of course, is that people like John Killen say, oh my God, you betrayed the race. You know, this is the worst thing that you could possibly do in, in, in the 1960s when all of this militancy is going on. Uh, but look at the way she stages this play so that it's actually about this black woman moving into a black community of other women as she tries to work out this relationship with this man. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Children never lets you forget that these two people do love each other. Mm -hmm. but, but what she does is she puts them on an equal footing. He's a baker, a working class white man. She's a seamstress, a working class black woman. They do love each other, but Childress's play dramatizes the structural racism in their situation so that they can't get out of it. Even mm -hmm. as much as they might love each other, they can't break out of this structure. Right. But she also has the black woman in this play say the most powerful things about slavery, about segregation, um, you know, uh, about white liberalism. All of that is voiced in this play at the same time that Childress holds on to this personal relationship as something that also has value. You know, that's a kind of nuanced story that yeah. in the 1960s, it didn't have the relevance as, as something like Dutchman, you know, where, mm -hmm. you know, he gets on the, on, on the train and says things like, you know, to the white woman, like, you know, Bessie Smith hates you. Uh, you know, you, you can't claim right. it. All of the things that he does in that play, you know, like I say, are immediately, you know, strike you, uh, you know, with their militants and, and, and anger. Right. She'll just weaves that anger right in here, but she never leaves it there. She makes you, she makes you go deeper. That's, that's really interesting. Do you, yeah, it is. I was going to say, Marianne, do you have um, other reflections on Childress's encounter, you know, in the 60s with Black Arts ideas, uh, does it affect her career? E even if she's not in direct, you know, contact with Baraka, um, or maybe that's just not important to her. Like you're saying, she's, you know, she's working in a parallel related, but maybe separate tradition, so. You know, I don't have any specific thing that she said about the Black Arts Movement. Mm -hmm. And I, I suspect that Childress would have been somewhat suspicious of, of, of black nationalism mm -hmm. because she always worked in not, not, not just interracial circles, but always in leftist circles. Mm -hmm. And so I think she wasn't drawn to nationalism. In fact, that's, that's there was also that I say in my book is that these other um, people from the 1960s, like Ossie Davis and um, right. Julian Mayfield, they all have this moment in which they leave the left and they, you know, say, you know, I've got, I've got to get closer to this kind of black nationalism. And mm -hmm. Childress never has a moment like that. So, okay. you know, it, it strikes me that, you know, it wasn't something that she was drawn to. Mm. Okay. Billy Joe, sounded like you wanted to say something there. Oh, I just want to say something like there's also uh, both with the beats and with the black nationalists, you know, there's this strong sexism. So that yeah, is something yeah. that seems like she would not find uh, find attractive. 
Yes, yeah, particularly in early Baraka. So, um, so it is now 3 p.m. my time in St. Louis, 4 p.m. Eastern in time. My, right. Yeah, the tyranny of the time zone, you know, some of us are in from California, I notice, and, and other times, but maybe it's time now to turn to some audience questions. Does that make sense? Sure, that's fine. That would be a good thing. So there's, we're gonna go to the Q&A function you folks in the audience want to leave a question, maybe we could go there. You can, I, I can also go back and forth between that and the chat. And I will start with a question from chat. I'm not sure if we can answer it, but um, <laughs> it's a question about, can, can we talk about how you see Adrian Kennedy fitting in with Alice Childress and Amiri Baraka? So reflections on any connection. I, I can't. No, I can't either. Neither can I, sadly. So sorry about. So we have failed the first question, and we're. Really <laughs> <laughs> but we would like to try to make it up to you in some subsequent questions. So shall we move over to the Q and A, or you can we can go and chat too. I can see both. Um, uh, I, I see four, five questions in the Q and A. All right. Well, let's go to the Q and A. Um, the first question I see from Dominic Taylor, who asks, can you speak about how blackness is performed in Childress's Trouble in Mind? Here, I mean the play within the play, Chaos in Belleville. That sounds like a question for you, Mary Helen. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I could say that the, uh, so Trouble in Mind is her 1955 play, the one she won the OB for. Okay. And the play within the play is called Chaos in Belleville. Wow. And that is the play that's being that's that's written by the director, a white man whose name is Manners. And it's a play that that requires the black people to do certain kind of stereotypical things. Mm -hmm. So the major <laughs> black woman in the play is the mother of a son. And at some point she is supposed to turn her son over to the authorities with the expectation that they will be fair. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the, the white guy's <laughs> idea of Southern justice. And the mother, the, play, the, the woman in, uh, actor goes along with it as long as she can. And then, <laughs> you know, she really can't stand it anymore. And she said, I can't find the, the yes, I can. I think I have, no, nope, I don't have it right here. <laughs> but she says, why would I, why would his mother send him out to, you know, to these authorities knowing that she can't trust them. And, you know, Manner says, well, you know, this is this is the play. This is how I wrote it. And she said, you know, that's the problem. Um, she says, <laughs> you know, uh, I, you wrote it that way. Let me see if I can find it actually in here where she says, OK, so this is the, the, the mother saying, tell me why this boy's people turned against him. Why are we sending him out into the teeth of a lynch mob? I'm his mother and I'm sending him to, to his death. That's a lie. Okay, then John, but his mother doesn't understand. Then we'll let her. Everything people do is count of their mother. Mm -hmm. And then there have been cases of men dragged from their homes. In other words, there have been cases like this. And then the, the black uh, woman says, but they was dragged. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they weren't sent to be killed by their mama. So she's staging this resistance to the white man's idea mm -hmm. of black life in mm -hmm. chaos in Belleville. And again, it's another way to me in which Childress is also staging a kind of Cold War dialogue. This is the kind of soft liberal position that the white audience could stand. And at some point, Manners says that. She, he says, this is as much as a white audience can take. And <laughs> so then you realize, you know, from, you know, that the other, play is reacting to, you're actually creating a play that is soft enough for this audience. Okay, thank you. And now we have a question uh, about two plays of Baraka's that I believe were published together, The Toilet and Baptism, probably his best known plays after Dutchman. Mm -hmm. Billy Joe, do you have some reflections on those and how they might fit into some of the issues we've been talking through? The Toilet and what's the other? Uh, to the Toilet and Baptism. Definitely. Yeah, uh, a little on the toilet, nothing on baptism. Okay. Um, uh, 
I think it's an interesting play in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. One, um, I mean, something, a scene comes up in it. Uh, well, it's about, it's about kids. Yeah. And there is a white kid and, uh, and, and there are black kids and the white kid is, um, you know, like they're, they're, they're friends, but uh, his friends don't like that to be. And finally it ends up with a, with a fight and, and the white boy is beaten up. I can't remember by him or somebody else. Mm -hmm. I wanna show uh, this picture. Oh, cool. Can, can you see this? Higher. Higher. It, Mary, yeah, perfect. They, you can see it. Okay. This is a staging of the toilet in Detroit, Michigan, back in the 60s. Yeah. And uh, I think it was staged by Woody King, who works in New York now. Yeah, and you, it, Woody King does yeah. a lot of Baraka stuff. Okay, still so, does. But the story is, you know, that these people are all, you know, they're, they're arguing, the young men are arguing and they're bullying the white kid. And it turns out that one of them, I think it's a black guy, is gay. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that goes back yeah, to well, what, the yeah. at the end to comfort the white guy. Yeah, but what happens? Yeah, that happens. I mean, the character, it's in the main character. And I don't know if he's gay or not, but uh, he comes, after this macho thing and beating up the guy, he right. comes back. He comes and, right, yeah. And he comes back to, to right. exactly to comfort the guy. Uh, now Baraka talks about that ending and said he was kind of forced to put it on. And I don't know if that's meaning he was like that. Forced to put on what? The ending where he comes back and comforts oh, the guy. Oh, I think. No, yeah, I don't. Think, right, right. I don't That's a that great. I would, I just like that. your sound. Nah. <laughs> no, he sound. didn't want to admit that he had that gay ending. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I see Robert Crossley has but, his. But hand before hand. that, the the set for the toilet is designed by Larry Rivers, oh. and it's a lovely set, and it's in some museum somewhere. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a fabulous play. Yeah. Mary Ellen, it sounds like you wanted to address Robert. Yeah, go ahead. A little bit. We'll come back to the questions above it, but there is a question from Robert Crossley. Is that the one I, you were? I can't see the question. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, Robert Crossley's question is this, and we we will come back to the questions above it. Many men and women who acted in the ANT, the American Negro Theater, are familiar names in American theater history because they moved on to Broadway or Hollywood, right? Os Davis and so on. I think. But are there names that should be known among black women and men who were directors in the 50s and 60s? Well, uh, directors. Yeah, or maybe I mean, just figures out of out of that world, right? Of black theater in the 1950s. I mean, well, maybe uh, B. Richardson. Um, she's one, she was a really fine actor. We see her again in, she plays with Sidney Poitier in the movie, In the Heat of the Night. Mm. Oh, That's the okay. last time I saw her. I think she plays a kind of conjure woman mm. uh, there. Because uh, Sidney Poitier was also in the ANT, yes? Sidney yeah. Poitier, Harry Belafonte, Lorraine Hansberry, all of them were in ANT. Uh, right. Ruby D, Ossie Davis. Right. Uh, Speaking of Lorraine Hansberry, there's another question about Lorraine Hansberry, who's, you know, certainly her profile has been much revived in recent years. There's some recent bi biographical work. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting that they are, it's, they're more sympathetic to her being a leftist now than they were before. So a that's just time. And, and a meaningfully queer playwright. Yeah, and right. Someone important in the history of sort of queer representation. It also seems to me that she's been revived in a kind of tight parallel with, with the Baldwin revival, right? They're often seen as comrades and friends and Baldwin and she both went to the famous meeting with you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy that resulted in a blow up of one form of the civil rights movement. But so any reflections on the relationship between both of our figures today and Lorraine Hansberry and the extraordinary revival of her work right now? 
you know, there's a strange uh, relationship between Childress and Hansberry mm -hmm. in that they never talk about each other. Uh, mm -hmm. At least publicly, they I, I can't find any statements about them. And yet they were, you know, working in New York in some of the same venues. They certainly knew each other. They were both on the left. But I think that there was some kind of, um, I don't know whether well, it was competitiveness or animosity uh, between them. So I don't know. And then, you know, Hansberry's play comes out in 59 and it's, it yeah. just kind of takes over the whole, you know, black media scene and everything else gets wiped out. You know, we see very few revivals of Childress's play. Raisin in the Sun is always being revived. Although, uh, Wedding Band, it, it, it was just produced uh, a few years ago, so it, it comes back. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Hansberry also dies in, what, 64? He dies really young of cancer, yeah. Yeah, and Childress is, uh, you know, dies in 1994. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's a long period of time in which Hansberry is absent. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's very strange that, that uh, Childress doesn't talk more about Hansberry. Mm -hmm. And it could be also that Hansberry kind of drifted away from the left. Mm -hmm. You know, she stopped identifying herself as a as someone on the left. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting. Um, I'm going to advertise my own work now, briefly, very briefly. But I, I was going to try to bring it up. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I swear to God, there's a germane point here. Okay. By the way, this gift goes great with a, a turnover in regimes uh, next month. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we are going to have one. <laughs> well, we are. I guarantee it. Anyway, no, well, can, I say, can I tell everyone just so they know that your book FBI's eyes E Y E S mm -hmm. is the for everyone at home, everyone watching. This it was the cornerstone of this entire event. Amy von Masick and I um, came across it, and we were looking at how black writers were censored censored, how they were limited, how they were silenced. And it, it's only fair to say that's why we're here today, because we came across um, Bill's book, F-E-I-S, E-Y-E-S. That's right. Well, th thank you very much. And what I was going to say, that actually, I was promised I was going to try to make a point with it is one thing that Childress and Hansberry have in common is that they were both targeted by the FBI in ways that seemed very intense and very early. Lorraine Hansberry has one of the longest FBI files of any black writer of the 20th century. Um, they were fascinated and worried about Raisin in the Sun, the FBI was, and they sent agents out to review the play before it made it to Broadway. When it was on its trial runs in New Haven and, and Philadelphia, there were actually FBI agents sent out. And in her FBI file, there are pretty elaborate reviews of the play that show you know, both let's just say heavy political interest, but also a certain amount of insight into aspects of its politics around the question of Africa that critics and, and other readers haven't emphasized till recent years. So it's pretty fascinating that way. Yeah. But anyway, let's get, let's get back to these questions. Um, oh, you didn't know. Um, what? what? You mentioned Baraka is also mentioned in the, uh, uh, portrayed in the book and it's quite fascinating because I, I didn't really know this material before, yeah. uh, but it's fascinating. The, the agents are so taken by him. Yeah. You know, they're sort of seduced. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't find him evil and bad, but they find him also attractive. Yeah. So it's quite incredible. And something that Mary Helen said earlier, and I felt bad about it when I, when I, when it went through my mind when I was reading this material. Mm -hmm. For a literary agent, uh, for a literary critic, these FBI files are great. You say, I was thinking, I said to, to my wife, I said, gee, if the FBI you know, snooped on everyone with fabulous material. Fabulous with material we would have. <laughs> One of the reasons this book exists is because Mary Helen kindly gave me a copy of Alice Childress's FBI file a long wow. time ago now. So she was willing to share her research. Let's put it that way. Right. Um, so people should buy the book. Oh, absolutely. Anyway, yes. I mean, it is really, it is okay, really an exciting and interesting book. I think people should buy several copies at one time, of course. Well, but I don't think one should be greedy. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go back to the questions. So um, 
We have uh, a questioner saying, you know, with the revival of Trouble in Mind due at the Roundabout Theater next year, this is a good question for both of you. What other Baraka or Childress works would you like to see mounted on contemporary stages? Right? If we're going to pick two or three that, you know, could be redone and you think would have a particular um, form yes. of address in the present, what would you like to see revived? So I would like to see her, her 1951 play, Go Through the Trees, revived in a modern kind of representation. Mm -hmm. So here, here's a play that begins in Africa and there's an African woman reciting a poem about the Middle Passage. Uh -huh. And then it moves to part two, which is about Harriet Tubman. Now it's not about Harriet Tubman rescuing anybody. It's about Harriet Tubman working in New Jersey <laughs> uh, to, to earn enough money for her trips uh, back south. Oh, and cool. she's working with two other women and the two other women are, are fearful of being arrested because they know that Tubman has a price on her head. So it's so it sounds Tubman, like a, an analogy with the Cold War, Mary Helen. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That's why I think it should be staged as a kind yeah. of Cold War play because all of these, see, these, these different um, sections of the play are all underground scenes. So here's, mm -hmm. here's Tubman in the underground trying to convince these other two women to keep working even though it's you know politically dangerous. Mm -hmm. And then the third part is the Martinsville seven part. And the fourth part is set in South Africa with two freedom fighters who are fighting against apartheid. Right. So I would love to see, cause you know, she, uh, Childress wrote the music for it. Um, she wrote the dance sequence sequences wow. and you know, so much of it could be visual. So the Martinsville seven section could be done with all kinds of video and, and different kinds of, uh, um, you know, screen images of, of, of the history of that. So that's the How play I would it? love to see revived. Okay. How long is it? Oh, it's probably, if you did it on stage, it would probably take two hours. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a diaspora and an avant-garde play in Ephesus. Yeah. And, and that's the way it would have to be done in kind of avant-garde style. Mm -hmm. And I think it could yeah, be. Yeah, sounds exciting. Even if they change the Martinsville seven to, you know, the Central Park Five. Right. Yeah. Or somehow wove that into to that section. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. Billy Joe, correspondingly, what would you like to see revived? I would, like, I would like two plays. One play, which is published with Dutchman, which is called The Slave. Oh, yeah. And it is takes place during the 19, uh, 1960s. Uh, a black revolutionary comes to his his um, to the house he used to live in. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to take his daughters away, and uh, his wife is now married to a, a white uh, uh, some type of let's go some sort of white guy, white intellectual. Mm -hmm. And the play is a really interesting. You know, there's a racial war going on. Uh, a line which went through my mind. This, this morning, because I was talking to somebody else about somebody something else. And so uh, the hero of the play is, is going, uh, you know, wants to bring about the revolution. And he, and he talks to the guy, the white guy, and he says, you know, I'd rather talk to you and my illiterate troops. Uh, and so there's this whole thing. There's something lost, a world that he, that's been lost for him. So that play, I think it'd be interesting and relevant to the moment. Mm -hmm. The other play, it's called The Most Dangerous Man in America. 19, uh, 2015, uh, it's about W.E.B. Du Bois. It was staged in New York, Woody this is, King. Pardon? This is a very late play, it sounds like. For us. Yeah, right, right. Uh, Woody King, uh, you know, produced it, uh, directed it. Mm. Uh, uh, it is not about Du Bois as a civil rights leader. It's about Du Bois as, as a, a, a communist. It's not Du Bois about integration. It's Du Bois about, um, about uh, seeking some sort of uh, black uh, liberation, human rights, black human rights. Right. Uh, 
there are a couple reasons. When it, you know, we we're talking about censorship, one thing about this play, so here it's Baraka, it's 2015. He has not, uh, uh, it's, you know, here's his famous playwright. It's staged in a little theater. Uh, it is, um, you know, where, where his stuff is ending up. And um, um, let's say it's staged in a little, uh, little theater. I just drifted, sorry. Uh, uh, this is a way that censorship works because he's not in these big places. It's a little off, off Broadway, off Broadway uh, uh, theater. The review of it in the New York Times, and you can just say this is, you know, personal, calls it basically inert and not very, not very good play. Uh, I and the audience found it a very exciting play. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I think the Times was looking for a different sort of different sort of person. So and it's a play that it's a play that it's hard to get. So I think it'd be terrific to 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 restage it, give it a second time. Yeah. There's a couple of, of comments on the chat. Go ahead, Mary Helen. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, there's a couple of comments on the chat that we should look at because they say there's a film version of the toilet on YouTube, but great. Then Lanisha reminds us that in the toilet, those two, the white guy and the black guy that goes back at the end were lovers. Mm -hmm. That was the hidden text of, of the toilet. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lanisha Gonzalez. Okay. Uh, I want to also say, I saw the slave staged yeah. in Detroit. Yeah, because you know, uh, Baraka and Woody King and David Rambo were friends and um, he did, he did several of, um, they did several of Baraka's plays in Detroit when Woody King was still in Detroit. And he, he staged it in a, a school, in a school auditorium, so that all the audience were, this is, no, this wasn't a slave, this was called Slave Ship. Oh. The and the audience had to be you know, part head. of yeah. the audience, had to be part of the people on the slave ship. It was very, uh, very dramatic. Yeah, people talk about, I've read it and been totally unimpressed. Yeah, but you have people to... who've seen it no. think yeah. it's magnificent. Well, it was, it was, it was, it was powerful, yeah. yeah. Powerful, that's a good yeah. word. I think both uh, Childress and Baraka were really um, born dramatists. They, they instinctively understood what was dramatic in the retelling of these stories. Mm -hmm. and stage them very well. It's why it's right. hard to talk about them without actually having, you know, the performance. Right. Yeah. Same thing with Baraka's poetry, right? Yeah, I was saying the poetry, the yeah. reading, right. Lives right. in the moment of reading. So I just want to, I want to throw it over to, to Amy from uh, the dramatist group because I believe she wants to make a, a something like a final statement. Um, oh, or, good. I want to hear it. <laughs> so <laughs> oh well that's so that's so much pressure no i just really <laughs> wanted to um i wanted to thank uh just sort of closing remarks um to thank all of our panelists today um and especially to thank my co-producer director of community engagement jenna crisponte um i know that we weren't able to get to everybody's question and i'm so sorry but we are recording this um, it will be available again on our website and on the DLDF website. Um, this production of Band Together was co-sponsored by the Dramatist Guild Political Engagement Committee and the Dramatist Legal Defense Fund. Uh, special thanks to the board of the DLDF and President John Weidman and to Nicole Salter and Gwydion Sullivan, chairs of the Political Engagement Committee. Um, I just wanna thank you all. If there's any, if there's like one more question or one more thought about um, Baraka and Childress that um, either of you would like to give, we'd love to hear it. And then I think we'll wrap it up for today. Well, there's a good question on here. Uh, I appreciate the discussion. Just wondered what panelists think about whether overt confrontational angry work is effective to encourage so social change. That is, is an excellent last question. Is, yeah, is reflective subtler work effective to encourage social change? Does art affect change? It sounds like it has a slant <laughs> question. 
No, I don't think so. The person is saying, does art affect change? No, the person is saying uh, certain styles of art, which ones affect change? Yeah. And does this sort of confrontational one? Well, you got the confrontational person, so you start. <laughs> what? I got the, oh, I got the confrontational person. <laughs> Yeah, I think what Mary Helen is saying is you're on, Billy Joe. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I just, yeah, I just thought I did. Not, I thought first she said I was the confrontational person. I, no, I'm, I'm not. I was like, I'm like Joe Biden. I'm a nice guy. But um, I think, I think it's sort of fascinating over time watching, uh, watching people respond to Baraka, and they respond. You know, they do respond to the confrontational work. Uh, that's all, and I don't know. And sometimes the subtler work, I'm not sure it's subtler. It's just uh, sometimes it's not revolutionary. Yeah. Well, you know, let me go back to um, to answer this question to Bill's work on J. Edgar Hoover. So here's something that Hoover said in the 1950s. He said, um, "The Reds have done a vast amount of evil damage." by carrying doctrines of racial revolt and communist, communism to the Negroes. And I'm thinking, you know, J. Edgar Hoover's version of reality did not stand. What, st what stand mm -hmm. are the people who actually took up racial resistance and racial revolt? That's what's come down to us. So yes, I think all of this art, both Barakas and Childress, they both affected change. Because we now look mm -hmm. at, at Hoover's words, and you know that's those are not the words that we feel uh, moved and changed by. So thank you. I Bill, think that's a great for ending. Giving us the FBI. It was like a lovely, <laughs> yeah. a good one. An early Christmas gift. Okay, <laughs> we thank need, you. We need all the gifts we can get right now. So. Well, this whole panel is a gift. Yes. Yeah. Jenna. Wonderful Amy, talking to you Bill, both. Yeah. So, you know, you can, I mean, I don't want to talk for my fellow pals, but I guess I will immediately, which is, you know, we are, we have email addresses, you know, we're supposedly teachers. Uh, so if people have particular questions, particularly write Billy Joe and Mary Helen, I think. <laughs> <laughs> they would your to book. answer every, anything you might. No, you can ask us. We'd be, I'm sure we'd be happy to correspond to the extent that we can. So okay. thank you all for coming. Thanks, yeah, thank you. See you thank all. you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. It's good to see you guys. Good good to talk see to you. Soon. Yeah, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenna.